I hope that I can inspire myself and the rest of you together as we look deeply into the words of Torah and we try to find inspiration in a time that, well, let's just say it's not that inspiring. It's not that inspiring to live with the anxiety about illness, infection, and an uncertain future. It's not that inspiring when people are worried about second or possibly third waves of a pandemic. And the notion of people being cooped up, quarantined, stuck at home, or uncomfortable going out to show, or for that matter, even going to work, is certainly able to dampen one's spirits. So I want to begin tonight by introducing you to two very famous people from the 20th century. It's eminently possible that many of you have heard their names. And if you haven't, well, you learn something about psychology in the 20th century. Both are Jewish. One was very American. The other was very European. And I don't think they ever met. The American psychologist or psychiatrist was the son of Ukrainian immigrants. He grew up in New York City. His neighbor is Abraham Maslow. And some of you are familiar with his ideas, the hierarchy of needs, and the notion of self-actualization. And Abraham Maslow pioneered this new approach where he said that if people didn't have their pyramid built properly, they'd never really be happy. He suggested that we needed to have a foundation in place, our, our basic needs, biological needs, food, shelter, climate control, that we needed to have things like friendship and love, that we needed to have something that would serve to interest us or give us a, a sense of uh, self-worth. And then on the very, very top of his pyramid is what he called self-actualization, a higher purpose, a higher meaning, something that was beyond the immediacy of our own orbit. There was another psychologist psychologist who lived at the very same time across the ocean, and his name was Viktor Frankl. And he was a student of Sigmund Freud, and he vehemently disagreed with his teacher. His teacher ridiculed him regularly. He, of course, is the father of logotherapy. And Viktor Frankl believed that what people needed more than anything else wasn't their biological needs, but rather a sense of mission, a sense of purpose. He believed that purpose itself could sustain a person even when everything else fell away. And when he ended up in Auschwitz as a doctor, he mentally took notes, watching everything that he saw. And this proved his thesis because nobody had their needs met. Everybody was bereft, biologically speaking. There was no food, there was no shelter, there was no friendship, there was no climate control. Some people who were healthier simply died and others survived. And Frankl believed this was because those who had meaning in life would be able to continue to live. His works have been translated into dozens of languages. I believe that his most famous book sold over 100 million copies. Logotherapy has become part and parcel of even pop psychology today. What I want to share with you or talk to you about tonight is meaning. Because meaning will give us something to live for. Now, Viktor Frankl kept himself alive during the darkest of times because he created meaning for himself. In his mind, he would meet his wife again. And the thought of meeting her again and being there for her sustained him. In his books, he writes that the most difficult time for him wasn't during the war, but after the war, after he discovered that his wife had perished in the gas chambers. So essentially, he lived, he created a meaning for himself, but it was a false hope. It wasn't really true. And he demonstrated that a person can live, a person can survive, a person can even flourish if they have meaning, even if that meaning isn't true. But my dear friends, we have meaning that is true. And I want to suggest to you this evening that regardless of where you live and the circumstances you face, that really 
despite the fact that you may have so much of your life disrupted and things that brought you joy and happiness aren't available now, you can not only survive, but you can flourish. You can flourish when you have a sense of mission, a sense of purpose, and a sense of meaning. There is this giant jigsaw puzzle out there, and every one of us has pieces to be able to put it together. Maybe there are trillions of pieces, but until that puzzle is put together, we won't be seeing the perfected, uplifted vision that the prophets spoke of and the sages dreamed of. Of course, I'm talking about mitzvahs. I'm talking about living a life of devotion and dedication, a life of love and loyalty to Hashem. I want to begin by sharing with you words of the Gemara, which are found in Meseches Kedushan on page 40, side B. The Gemara says, La'olam yire adam atmei. A person should always view himself ki'ilu as if he's 50% wanting or even guilty. Guilty for sins of commission or possibly sins of omission. But not utilizing the potential that Hashem has given you is really a problem. It's a sin. And the gematria of chet equals chesar on deficiency. On the other hand, a person should view himself as chetz zakai as 50% meritorious. And if your scales are perfectly balanced, the Gemara says, im asa mitzvah achas, if you do even a single mitzvah, just a single mitzvah. So what happens is, <laughs> Asherav, how fortunate is that person? He's weighed his proverbial scales down in a meritorious way. However, the Gemara says, if a person committed even a single sin, oiloi, what was to him? Shehechria, because he weighed himself or caused his situation to move in a direction, in a direction in which he's found wanting, in which his demerits were able to outweigh his merits. And the Gemara goes on to quote a Pasuk from Kohelis, from Ecclesiastics. In the ninth chapter, the 18th verse says, echod yabed harbe. One sin or the loss of a single opportunity can actually result in a very consequential impact. Bishvil chet yechidi shechato. For one sin, for one mistake, for one misstep or misdeed that a person did, oivid mimenu toivis harbe. A person can lose everything. And so the first thing that I want to say to all of you is that each and every moment of life, as a rule, provides us with opportunities. Opportunities for mitzvahs, or chas v'shom, the opposite. We can choose to recite a bracha over the food we eat or just choose to pleasure ourselves. We can choose to smile at a person, even if we don't particularly like them. We can be kind and considerate or we can choose to be mean and capricious. We can be sensitive to the needs of others, or we can be oblivious, you know, a bull in a china shop. At any moment in time, we can choose to ruminate or focus on words of Torah and words of spirituality. We can choose to daven every day. We can choose to put on that film. We can choose to put something in the tzedakah box in the pushka. We can choose to eat kosher. We can choose to live a life that's punctuated with holy and sacred meaning. And if you think to yourself, well, you know, it's one mitzvah, it's one moment, what difference could it possibly make? The Gemara tells us otherwise. It could make all the difference. The Rambam famously quotes these very words in the context of halacha. Because, you know, sometimes the words of Gemara, well, they make for a nice sermon but they aren't actually halachically binding. They don't resonate in the real world. Well, this particular Gemara makes its way into Hilchas Chuba. After the Rambam tells you that each and every single person should view himself as if this is his last day. You never know if this is the last chance that you might have to perform mitzvahs in this world. 
Ein Adam Yedea Itavar Gov. Nobody knows his time. And because of this, the Rambam says, because a person never knows when his or her time comes, you have to see yourself all year long. As if your scales are perfectly balanced. The Rambam here is quoting the Gemara in Meseches Kedushin, but he's quoting it in halachic, legally binding context. The Rambam goes further. And the Rambam goes on to say that just as the Gemara discusses, the notion of the fisha ha'olam nidun acharubai, because the entire world can be judged by means of majority. And there's a dispute here between Rashi and Rambam whether this means a majority of good deeds or meritorious acts or people. But the point is that the world might be in a perfectly balanced state in a single mitzvah. A single mitzvah can make all the difference. You know, you could be in a circumstance, a situation, but you want to explode where you're so angry and frustrated. Instead, you choose to bite your lip. You could have said something mean and hurtful, but you chose not to. You were hungry. The food that was available, well, it wasn't kosher. But you're hungry. And you choose, you choose to swallow hard and to wait until something which is permitted becomes available. That could bring about a world of difference. The Gemara says it. The Rambam says it, la The Rambam speaks about, really, aserity me tshuva when he's conveying this to us. He says there are times when the world is judged or times when you might be judged. I've shared this Gemara, I've shared this Rambam with people, and their response was predictable. They said, you know what? That's like one in a trillion chance. That's like, I'll win the lotto more quickly than I'll be the one to bring Mashiach. After all, there are 14 million of us, Bnei O Bnei Yisrael, and there are billions of others. We all have a sacred duty and a responsibility to Hashem Yisbarach. We're all expected to live lives that are holy. There's actually a dispute amongst the, the achronim, amongst the commentaries on the Gemara, whether this includes all of humanity. And in that case, people say to me, that's not something I can live by. Do a mitzvah now because, because one in six billion. If now is the moment the world is being judged, if now is the moment, if now is my last moment. So from this Gemara and this Rambam, I want to take you in a direction of the way Hasidus illuminates life. According to the teachings of the Alter Rebbe and Tanya, the truth is that this notion of global transformation is not only maybe one in six billion. And it's not only something that might happen at the particular moment or might not have happened because of your omission. In fact, the Alter Rebbe, when he talks about the purpose of life, he invokes the famous Medrash Tanchuma. And the words of the Medrash are, Nisava HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Almighty craved, yearned, or desired. Kishem Shigesh Lidira Lamaila, that just as God has a dwelling place on high, Shiyehei Leikach Dira Lamata, that God should have a dwelling place below. In Parshas Nasai, there the Medrash Tanchum is even more explicit. It states, Bishar Shabbat HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the Holy One, blessed be He, created the world. He desired to have a dwelling place in this lower reality in the same way that He has in a higher reality. Now what does that mean? What does that mean, God dwells on high or dwells below? Isn't God everywhere? Isn't all of existence something that's brought into it's reality by God each and every single moment? What is the meaning of God dwelling in one place or the other? Those are good questions. But before we answer them, I want to point out that from a Jewish perspective, from a Torah to Jewish perspective, especially as it's illuminated by the incredible light of Chassidus, life, the gift of life, 
is not about an obstacle course that you need to get through so you can win yourself the largest slice of heavenly chocolate cake. Some people think that, that in order to be meritorious, in order for them to go to heaven, God had to put them into a world or situation in which the presence of the Creator is concealed, in which that which is good and righteous is camouflaged, in which morality and holiness are obfuscated, and you have to overcome these obstacles. And when you overcome these obstacles, you score points. Like, you know, Mario or Pac-Man. You're eating all the points and you're jumping over the obstacles. And as long as you can make it to the top and as long as you can collect as many holy points or merits as possible, you'll have the most beautiful heaven. And they'll tell you, well, God loves us. And God wants what's good for us. And because he loves us and because he wants what's good for us, he puts us in a situation where we get to manufacture our future. We get to create the exquisite tomorrow. But if you think about it, it's really such a selfish way to look at life. Are you worshiping Hashem, God? Or are you really worshiping yourself then? Are you looking for what's good for me? Or are you bowing your head in subservience and asking God, what can I do for you? When God introduced himself to all of us at the time of mass revelation at Har Sinai, Hashem spoke to us personally. Each and every one of us felt the presence of Hashem. He said, I am the Lord, your God. I took you out of Egypt. Each and every one of us experienced that face-to-face -face kind of encounter. We don't really know what that means because in our living memory, we can't recall it. But we had this experience. As Maimonides, as Rambam says, a blind person will never understand the beauty of color or a sunset. A deaf person couldn't possibly appreciate the sounds of music. For spiritual reality, we're basically deaf and blind. We don't really have the ability to know what this means. But when Hashem did introduce Himself to us, when we did see the essence of God or divinity, He said, I took you out of Egypt. You were slaves to the Pharaoh. Now you're mine. We're indentured or indebted to God. We are His servants. This isn't about us. This isn't about our own pleasures or joys or success, accomplishments or achievements. This is about living a holy life that's dedicated to a higher purpose. This is about having the privilege of bringing about the destiny that Hashem endowed for each and every one of us. So how does that work? Well, you know, when we talk about higher and lower, it's obviously not a spatial thing. We're not talking about a 3D reality. In the Rambam we learned about yesterday, he tells us that the notion of higher and lower is not to be understood in a physical or material sense. Imagine you were to speak about somebody who's extremely wise and erudite. And that wise, a brilliant person is delivering a dissertation. And most of the people, they're not there. Or they feel distant. And then there's one person who's really close, able to follow every word, every idea. It's not about physical closeness or distance. It's a conceptual thing. Deep ideas aren't discovered when you dig in the ground. And lofty experiences don't require a spaceship. The notion of high and low, insofar as ruchnius, insofar as godliness, as holiness and spirituality are concerned, is being aware of the truth. In the highest of worlds or realms, the creatures there, angels or seraphs, are so aware of the presence of God, they don't even know they exist. All they're aware of is God's presence. And the meaning of lower worlds, lower worlds in the celestial or higher realms mean that slowly they begin to feel a sense of self. And the more there's a sense of self, there's less there's a sense of God, the truth. But there's only one place 
There's only one place, my friends, where the presence of the Creator is entirely, entirely not seen, felt, or known. There's only one place, there's only one reality in which atheists can prosper. There's only one reality where absolute denial of God and a full sense of self-awareness permeates and punctuates every iota of its existence. And that's the lowest of worlds. That's our world. That's the world God placed us in. That's the meaning of Olam Hazah Hagashmi. That the physical terrestrial world is called Tachtim. It's the lower world. It's ground zero for a sense of lowliness. She'ein Tachtim Lamata Himeno. It doesn't get any lower. Only we think we created ourselves. Only in our world can demigods declare their own divinity, ignoring the presence of Hashem's constant bringing reality into existence. And you know what? Hashem says, Hashem says to his children, I want you to make a diru betachtainim. I want you to take this world. I'm known in the higher worlds. I want to be known in your reality. I want to be known in the world that's capable of absolute, total denial of godliness. I want to be known in the world, in the world where atheism can flourish. I want to be known in that world. And the way God is known in this world is when we utilize the material reality that on the surface seems to obfuscate or totally conceal the presence of the Creator. When we utilize that for a holy and a sacred purpose, and when we do, when we do, we are able to extract this proverbial sparks of divinity and goodness that are embedded. And that, by the way, is the meaning of tikkun olam. Tikkun olam doesn't even mean to fix the world. It means more like to perfect the world. Tikkunim are like accoutrements or jewelry or, you know, things that bring out the beauty, like good lighting or something that's framed appropriately, like a beautiful setting for a diamond. That is the meaning in Aramaic of litakona. Tikkun olam litakin olam means to perfect, to beautify, to bring forth the incredible potential that our world has. You can't eat wheat or barley, but if it's properly cooked or baked, it can become a source of nourishment. In fact, it becomes delicious. Things that are raw, have to be fixed. And the fix is to bring forth its wonderful potential. We live in a world that is exploding with potential. We live in a world that's saturated with possibility, possibility for holiness. Everything in our world can be used for a holy purpose. And the things that can't be, well, they're there are stepping stones to enable us to get to the things that can be elevated. And you say to yourself, what does that have to do with me? And I say to you, everything. It has everything to do with you. Because every single time you do a mitzvah, you take one tiny part of our world that is so dark and devoid of holiness and the presence of the Creator, you make it see-through. You, you make it reflect its truth. And whilst we don't see any of this. All we see is the chaos. When Mashiach will come, every single mitzvah we did will resonate with such clarity. Its impact will be so obvious. It's like enormous amount of chaos and suddenly the electromagnet pulls it all together. And in a moment, trillions and trillions of different energies are snapped into place and a stunning picture emerges. Every single time you do a mitzvah, you actually are placing one more piece in that gorgeous, godly jigsaw puzzle. You're making this world the divine place it was always intended to be. You made a bracha over a glass of water and maybe you drank it a few moments ago and with its hydration, you're now able to listen and be inspired, I hope. Well, you elevated that glass of water. And if you'll make an after bracha thanking Hashem for it, you will have released or redeemed its holy energy. Now you're going to say, well, 
you know, I'm just one little yidula living in Florida or Thornhill or wherever else people are joining us from. And maybe, maybe in areas where there's a Torah community where there's people who get together and do holy things. So, so maybe there can be some elevation. Maybe there can be some kind of transformation, even if we don't see it. But what about enormous swaths of planet Earth where there's no mitzvahs being done at all? There was once a man in Yechidus, in the Rebbe's study, and he asked the Rebbe this very question. And he happened to be wearing a raincoat. And the Rebbe said to him, where was your raincoat made? The man shrugged, he didn't know. And the Rebbe asked him to look at the label. And he looked at the label and it was made in a, a distant country. A place where, as the Rebbe once said, they don't call it close. And the Rebbe said to him that when you use that raincoat to leave your house on a blustery day and to do a mitzvah, whether it's a favor for someone else or participating in a communal prayer service in a minion, the raincoat is elevated. It's not just the raincoat. The factory that made that raincoat, all of the machinery that had to be manufactured elsewhere and eventually assembled, the people who built that building, the trucks, cars, planes, or ships and all of their components, the food that the people who were manning the assembly line ate, and the farmers who planted that food, the tractors they used, and all of the machinery and mechanism that would be involved, you know, to produce a single raincoat. It's like almost a global event. There are so many contributing factors to every little tiny detail. I'm talking to you on an iPhone. I don't know where it was assembled, but I do know that it's a very sophisticated piece of machinery. Something that only decades ago would barely fit into a room and today it fits into your hand. And there were probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who had something to do with the creation of this very phone as it is now. There's a microphone and a wire and there's all of you who are on, who are on the, the laptop. All of this is being elevated right now as we speak. Right now as we speak, there might be millions and millions of details that are being elevated because of all of us and we may not even number 100 or 50. The point is that we need to start to have global vision. When you eat dinner, whatever was involved in making that dinner a reality is elevated if you ate dinner properly. We all have a piece of that puzzle. In Peter Klamet Zayin and Tanya, the Alter Rebbe says that the Jewish nation is comprised of 600,000 root souls. And that's why that's the approximate number that leaves the land of Egypt. And 40 years later, we're still at just about that number. That proverbial number represents root souls, not people. Every one of those root souls could have as many as 600,000 particles. Think of every cell and the substructures that are in those cells. And those cells come or form, come together and form a larger entity. And each and every one of us is part of a larger cell. And the world, al Rebbe says, is also divided into 600,000 parts. 600,000 parts, moving parts of creation that all need to be elevated. When I do my job, when you do your job, we're in effect doing exactly that. And here's the thing. You and I, with our many challenges and gifts, with the obstacles we face and the help we receive, you and I have exactly enough wherewithal, energy, creativity, and ability that's needed. Exactly enough. Not one ounce more, not one ounce less. And because of that, every moment of our life is a gift. David HaMelech says, Yom Hashem formed days. 
Veloy echad bahem. And in those days, in those days, we have to live a life of echad. A life of echad, Aleph represents, Alufa Shalel of the creator of heaven and earth. Ches represents the proverbial eight orbits or the idea of the heavens, seven, and then earth. And Dalad, four, represents the different directions. When a Yid says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elekeinu, Hashem Echad, he is fulfilling the mitzvah of Yichud Shmai, which was yesterday's Rambam. He's fulfilling the mitzvah saying, I know, I believe. To me, it's clear. There is a creator who brings all of this together. And that that creator, an awesome, incredible creator we can't fathom for reasons beyond our imagination, craves a relationship with us and wants to live and be revealed here in this world. And we're given everything we need to do that. Not one ounce more, not one ounce less. And we need to do it well. We need to use every ounce of koyach. We need to throw ourselves into it. You know, the Rebbe introduced 12 psukim. And there's much to be said about those 12 psukim. And perhaps we'll have an opportunity another time. Each one of those psukim represents a step towards the self-actualization of our life as B'nai or B'nai Yisrael, as Hashem's special children. The 12th pasuk doesn't actually represent a particular step. Everything's been accomplished. The world and its fullness is waiting for us to elevate and transform it. The last pasuk is Yismach. The last pasuk is, pasuk is, find joy in the mission Hashem gave you. The last pasuk is that we should be jumping for joy when we think about the incredible opportunity that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. Us. We were allowed to be Hashem's partners. We. We were privileged to be able to transform reality forever. You just got to use the strength you've got. And in case you slipped up a few times, in case you didn't always bat a thousand or score as high as you could, should, or would have, we're told that a yid can always do tshuva. And that tshuva is this remarkable ability that can not only set us on a new course for the future, but in fact, almost inexplicably, can transform the past to the point that zdoines, that shortcomings, failures, can serve as catalysts, make us better people, better yidin. And they become zochies, they therefore become meritorious. We have such amazing opportunities available to us now. Never before was it so easy for people to connect, really, all over the world. Never before was it so easy for us to be able to encourage each other and inspire each other, to uplift each other, and to bring each other joy. Never before, never before was there the opportunity to be so close, and unfortunately, so many of us are still so far. And so, Rabbi Pinney, I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a gift. It's a beautiful gift to be able to speak to my brothers and sisters, wherever they may be. And I hope, I pray, that together we'll inspire each other, we'll up uplift each other. That when we leave our little session, our little fabrengen, we'll rededicate ourselves to making this world the beautiful, godly garden it can, and Be'ezer Hashem very soon will be. And you need to know that that meaning is not imaginary. It's not like winning a lottery. It's not like some far out possibility. Maybe my mitzvah will be the one. Your mitzvah is the one. I don't know if it's the one to weigh the scales down. I can't tell you your mitzvah will be the one to actually transform everything. Although somebody's mitzvah is going to be that. I can tell you that Chassidus explains and illuminates this idea that every one of us each time we do the right thing and each time we avoid something that's inappropriate, every one of us 
is in fact making this world a holier and godlier place. That we're all accelerating the universal process of redemption, of Geula of Yeshua. In today's Torah portion, we start off with Masay B'nai Yisrael, with the journeys of the Jewish people, and there are 42. The Degel Machne Ephraim, the grandson of the Alter Rebbe, of the Baal Shem Tev, repeated in the name of his Zayda, that each and every one of us experiences 42 journeys. The Rebbe spoke about this, and he said, Sadikim, they know which journey they're up to. The rest of us, we just have to rely on Hashem. <laughs> he, he brings us, we know and believe that he brings us to the right place at the right time. And we just have to do whatever we can, utilizing every opportunity that comes our way. We have 42 journeys on a personal level and as a nation. As a nation, we have 42 journeys. And the Rebbe told us that we're in the last journey. We're al yarden yirechai. We're at the Jordan River, proverbially speaking, we're just at the threshold. Yarden Yerecha is also a euphemism for Mashiach, who is Moireach Vadoin, who'll be able to judge merely with scent and the power of being able to just know exactly what's going on. We're there. We're at the end of that journey. Maybe these difficulties are the final throws. I don't know. But I do know and do believe with all my heart with all my mind and all my soul. As the Rebbe told us, we are at the threshold, that we are at, really, the very last moments of Golos, and Yer Hashem, the Korev, will be Amenu, speedily, and in our days, together we will walk over that proverbial line into an amazing new world, a world That'll be the result of the mitzvahs we've performed, the Torah we've studied, the passionate prayers we've offered, and the goodness we've generated. The Mehera will be amen speedily, and in our days, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Kaplan. And if it's okay, maybe we have a little bit of time for about five, 10 minutes. Maybe we could take a couple of questions. So if anybody wants to ask Rabbi Kaplan anything or myself, Chat, send me a, a question and maybe I'll forward it to Rabbi Kaplan. I do want to thank you, Rabbi Kaplan, for a very, very inspiring lecture. I will say that it's known amongst the Chabad elite that nobody prepares for a lecture more than Rabbi Mendel. Whenever he gives a, uh, a lecture, you'll see 10, 15, 20 books in front of him. He's, uh, he's, he has a wealth of the resources and you could see him and I'm so happy that he was able to share it with us tonight. So Rabbi Mendel, thank you so much. And as we mentioned before the class, Rabbi Kaplan gives daily classes. You could see many of his classes on Chabad.org, but even more important, I think it behooves each and every one of you to sign up and subscribe to his YouTube, his growing YouTube class that has thousands of subscribers already. Go to youtube.com, Rabbi Mendel Kaplan forward slash live. And also while I'm advertising his, as I mentioned before, I've never done this, but I'm trying to build up my YouTube where we have all of the classes that we've been offering. So you could go and get a copy of that to youtube.com forward slash Chabad SWB for Chabad Southwest Broward. You could also go onto the Chabad of Florida um, Facebook page and join us there. We have the classes there, and we also have all of the classes on Facebook Live if you want to watch it there.